Lesson four is derivatives of inverse functions. And actually, I think lesson five will be derivatives of inverses also. They'll be specifically inverses of trig functions. because They have specific derivatives. We are looking today at just a general rule of how you find derivatives of inverse functions. Okay? It's a general rule that will always work, and it's one that you want to be very familiar with. And we're going to use it in a lot of different ways, shapes, forms today. And tomorrow, that is. So, um, if you recall from pre-calc, algebra 2, definitely pre-calc, f of x, um, a function f of x is 1 to 1 if it will pass the horizontal line test and also technically the vertical line test. Okay, so vertical line test tells us whether or not it's a function. Horizontal line test you did a year ago in pre-calc. And that tells you whether or not the function has an inverse. Okay? And so if something's one-to-one, -one, it's a function and has an inverse. Um, we will talk about the fact that an inverse function will undo the original function. And this can be seen in the test to prove two functions are inverses of each other. You did this in Algebra 1 and Algebra, or not Algebra 1, excuse me. Algebra 2 and Pre-Calc, because I've taught it both times. But when you compose two functions, so f composed with f inverse of x, and, or the other way around, f inverse composed with f, both ways it will always equal x. If it's a function and the other function is truly its inverse, okay? If you have a function and its inverse, when you compose them together, either way, it will always equal x. And that is one way algebraically if you need to, you can test to see if two functions are really inverses of each other. Okay? Um, definition of an inverse. A function g is the inverse of the function f if f of g of x equals x for each x in the domain of g and g of f of x equals x for each domain and each x in the domain of f. So this is exactly what we are saying up above. Basically, it's the idea that fog has to equal x and goth has to equal x. So a function composed with its inverse and the other way. Now, g is commonly used to represent the inverse function. But if you just see a g, that doesn't mean it's the inverse function. A statement would have to be made that says g is the inverse of f. Um, reflective property of inverse functions. The graph of f contains the point a comma b. If and only if the graph of the inverse contains the point b comma a. That takes us back to algebra 2 and pre-calc, right? If x, y is on the regular function, then y, x is on the inverse function. That is what we're saying here, okay? So, a little bit of basics here to introduce. Example 1. Use the reflective property of inverse functions and the function values for f and g in the table at the right in, to complete the table of values for the respective inverse functions f inverse and g inverse. Then use them to answer the questions below. So, in part A, the table of values for f inverse of x. So up here in our table, we have an f excuse me, an x column and an f column, correct? What's that look like over in the inverse table? Is my x value still 3? If we're going down, down to the inverse table? No, what's the ordered pair of 3, 2 become? 2, 3. Two, three. What's the ordered pair 1, negative 1 become? Negative. negative 1, 1. And the ordered pair negative 1, 4? Or negative 1. So the idea there that if those are the provided input x values and output f values, they switch in the inverse. What about g inverse then? With g, you are looking at the ordered pair... 3, negative 1. What's the ordered pair 3, negative 1 become? Negative 1, 3. 
1, 0 becomes 0, 1, and negative 1, 3 becomes 3, negative 1. Right? Okay. Now, you won't always be you wouldn't necessarily be provided the inverse tables, right? But you can always make your own inverse tables. Food for thought there. Okay, use the tables above to evaluate each of the following expressions. F of G inverse of zero. Okay, you guys know how to do this stuff. What's G inverse of zero? One. One. So then the question becomes, what's F of one? Negative one. Pretty easy to do because we've got all the tables provided, right? Okay, D, F inverse of F of negative one. What's F of negative one? What is it? Four. I hadn't found it yet, so I couldn't tell you if you were right or wrong. And then what's F inverse of four? Negative one. Okay, F inverse of G inverse of negative one. What is G inverse of negative one? So then what is F inverse of three? I wrote it down, so that's your hint that we haven't done anything wrong so far. Do we know F inverse of 3? No. Is this when we do like the negative two. 1 minus 3 over the something over? Two. We're not talking derivatives. Okay. It's just F inverse. It's just a function value. We don't know F inverse of 3. Okay, so I would not defined, undefined. Because in the information we have, it is not defined. So not defined or undefined. I think I'm going to write undefined. Although I don't know. I kind of like not defined. I guess I don't like not defined as much as I thought I did. Because I'm right on that toolbox. It's going to keep popping up. Now I'm, I'm not that close to it. Okay, well that didn't work out as well as I thought. Okay, so yeah, it's not defined. That's all That's all it comes down to. That's why I kind of like the wording not defined because it's just not defined at that value, okay? Okay, last one, F, excuse me, G inverse of F inverse of four. What's F inverse of four? Negative one. What's G inverse of negative one? Three. Okay, you're just reading the charts there. Okay, again, if you were just provided the original information, you would have to go up to that chart and read it appropriately. Okay. Existence of an inverse function. A function has an inverse function if and only if it is what we call one-to-one. -one. If F is strictly I know I'm trying to remember which way to pronounce the word, that's why I pause. Monotonic, as opposed because I don't yeah, monotonic on its entire domain. In other words, either just increasing or just decreasing on its entire domain, then it is one to one and therefore has an inverse function. Okay, so in other words, if you have something increasing or something decreasing. I started to say a line. It's not necessarily a line, but each x value will be paired with each y value, each y value once, right? There won't be any repeats. So um, it would be one to one. It pass vertical test and horizontal line test, and therefore has an inverse function. Okay, the relationship between a composite function and its inverse is stated below. I've already talked about this a couple of times, right? We do this in Algebra 2 and Precalc, that when you compose a function and its inverse, it will always equal x or whatever your input is. Okay? 
if you use the chain rule and differentiate both sides, you can find a formula for the derivative of the inverse function. Now, why is this important right here? Why are we taking our time to do this? Well, what if you forget the derivative inverse formula? Is it helpful to be able to figure out the formula for the derivative of an inverse? And I'm going to say it is. Okay. Um, the formula we're going to, I'll be honest, is on the next page. But we're going to do the proof here, just to kind of practice. Now, for the purposes of this proof, I'm going to say, working with f and f, f inverse is going to get kind of confusing, especially when we're getting ready to throw derivative signs in there also. So I'm going to let f inverse be equivalent to g. And we're going to use f and g instead of f and f inverse. Now, I can't just do that without defining it. Okay, so what am I doing off to the side? I'm defining it. I'm stating that, okay, in this problem as I proceed, g is going to take the place of f inverse. So with that said, I can rewrite f of f inverse to be f of g of x. Agree? Nothing fancy there. Okay. So now we're going to take the derivative, yes? And we're going to... I'm going to write it as, when you take the derivative of something, we can show that we're going to take the derivative by putting a d dx out front, and that's just saying we're taking the derivative of this with respect to x. So I'm going to say I'm taking the derivative of f of g of x with respect to x. Whoops. And what we do on the left? we have to do on the right. So we're going to take the derivative of the right. And the derivative of the right, or the right is just x. So this is me just saying, as opposed to just magically things changing, I'm taking the derivative. Okay? What is the derivative of f of g of x? We've done this. What is the derivative? Go ahead. A little too much thrown in the middle there, or in the. So the derivative of f of something is. f prime of something, correct? Derivative of f of something is f prime of something. But then the chain rule says then we have to do times the derivative of something. So my something was g of x. What's the derivative of g of x? g prime of x. On the right, what's the derivative of x? One. Nothing fancy there, right? Now, what are we trying to find? We're trying to find formula for derivative of an inverse, yes? And I ask that because it's what are we trying to solve for? And if we're trying to find formula for derivative of an inverse, okay, that means we're trying to find f inverse prime, right? Which, what am I using for f inverse, though? G. So what am I trying to solve for here? G prime. Okay? Because before we proceed, we have to know, what, what are we doing with this mess? We're trying to solve for f inverse, the deriv derivative of f inverse, which means we're trying to solve for G prime. How do we solve for G prime? We're going to divide by everybody else. 
If it's f prime of g of x times g prime of x, then I can divide by f prime of g of x. If I divide the left by f prime of g of x, then we're going to divide the right. So I end up with g prime of x is equal to 1 over f prime of g of x. Now, I am going to switch it back to f inverses, but that is our formula for derivative of an inverse. More commonly seen, more commonly how you'll see this written is instead of g, if we go back to f inverse, and that's a challenge right there to write, f, the derivative of f inverse. Somewhere there you have to get the derivative mark but you can't let it interfere with the exponent of negative 1. And we're going to write this as over 1 over f prime of f inverse of x. And that is our derivative of an inverse formula. one that you need to work on knowing, being familiar with, memorizing. I know I say that about a lot of stuff. I know your brains are growing quite a bit with calc this year because you're having to memorize a lot, but that's what it is. So derivative of an inverse of a function is 1 divided by f prime of f inverse of x. So that's the derivative of the regular function composed with the inverse of the function. Okay. Got it? Okay. Let's try and use this guy some. Or at least they think. Is that what the next... Okay. Okay. Given f of x equals 4x minus 3 given the derivative at 2 equals 4, find the value of f inverse of 5, the derivative of such. f inverse derivative of 5? I don't really have a good way to read that. So, that is our final goal. And Sorry, I'm trying to. I'm debating which way to go with this. So I might go ahead and carry my formula down from above, okay? Because that's what we're going to have to use here in a moment. So my formula from above was f inverse, or the derivative of f inverse of x is one over f prime of f inverse of x. Okay, so this is our this is our formula from above. Now, as we start to work on this, we have to gather some other information, and they're not going to tell us all the information, of course. Okay, you have to kind of figure out some information. Now, keep in mind, if this is f inverse of 5 I'm trying to find, if 5 is the input to an inverse function, what type of value is 5 really? Is it an x or a y? You see what I'm saying here? Because normally it's f of x equals a y value, right? But if this is f inverse, keep in mind that this is really a y value of 5. Because the input to a y is, excuse me, the input to an inverse is a y value. Okay, so. If we think about this equation as y equals 4x minus 3. 
Okay. Now I guess here, let me fill this in real quick so you know where we're going with this. In my brain, I know where I'm going with it, but realize here that as I fill in this equation, right, we're trying to find F inverse, derivative of F inverse of not X, but what are we trying to find? Five, right? So realize as I fill this in, I'm going to be doing one over F prime of F inverse of five. So what's the first thing I have to find here? F inverse of 5. What did I just try and point out to you? That 5 is a y value. We don't have an inverse function here, do we? But we, what we do know is if the input to an inverse value function is y, or is 5, then we can think about it like this. We can think about is when does 4x minus 3 equal 5? So when does 4x minus 3 equal 5? Add x equals 2. Add 3. 4x equals 8. x equals 2. So realize what we just discovered there is f of 2 is equal to 5, correct? If I put 2 into that equation, I'm going to get 5 out. If f of 2 equals 5, then what do I know? Wrote the wrong thing. If f of 2 is 5, then f inverse of 5 is 2. What did we need to know over here in our formula? f inverse of 5. So I can continue this now. 1 over f prime of, what is f inverse of 5? 2. Continuing on. Now I need 1 over f prime of 2. What is f prime of 2? That is provided as 4. So we just discovered the inverse, the derivative of the inverse at 5 is 1 fourth. Okay. It gets better as we get through the process more, but it is a little, you really have to kind of think it out. Okay, process, what are they giving you, and how do we put it all together? Okay, I'm going to talk about the top of the page real quick, top of the next page. We're going to have a lot. Maybe we won't get her to Tuesday, Friday. But I'm not here Friday to teach. Oh, shoot. So, besides the fact I don't want to teach the day before fall break, you know. Just like I was going to have you work on review, but I wasn't going to tell you to work on the review over fall break. I was going to say, you know. Start working on in class, but then we'll pick up on it after break. Okay, the top of the next page real quick. To find the derivative of an inverse function. This is basically what we just discovered here, okay? So let f and g be inverse functions such that f of g of x and g of f of x both equal x, where f of a equals b, and then g of b equals a. So again, that switch of the in, uh, inverse there. To find the inverse at a certain point for point A, B. Things you're going to have to know. You're going to have to know the derivative of F. The derivative of F. Okay, so that's one thing you can find. You can find it right off the bat. Or you can find it when you discover, oh, hey, I need to know that. Which is more typically what I do. If you're only given B, which is what we were just given last time. We were only given the Y value, right? We had to set it equal to the function to find what the input value was. You have to know the derivative at that given point. And then we're going to know, well, okay, don't worry about step four. Here's the key, guys. F inverse, derivative of F inverse of X is one over F prime of F inverse of X. That's the formula we just derived, yes? 
That's exactly what we just learned, and that's what we want to know. The other thing we'll also talk about tomorrow, inverse functions have reciprocal slopes at corresponding points. Okay? And we'll talk about that tomorrow and how that can help us and give us some shortcuts at certain points. I would love to do this problem, but we're not going to get it in, are we? So we'll just stop there, and I will pick up on example three tomorrow, I guess. You're right. It's on, it's on my desk. Even better.